Hello and welcome back to Hilbert Spaces, the video series where we talk about the analysis we can do in vector spaces with an inner product. And indeed, in today's part 9, we will talk about a special property in Hilbert spaces, namely the so-called projection theorem. Roughly speaking, this theorem will tell us that the orthogonal projection works in every Hilbert space. However, as always, before we show this, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget that you can click the link in the description to find a lot of additional material for the videos. And then without further ado, I would say let's merely start stating the important projection theorem for Hilbert spaces. So you see, as stated in the last two videos, we need the two things. On the one hand, we need the inner product, and on the other hand, we need the completeness of the space. And moreover, we will also consider a closed subspace U inside our Hilbert space X. So also there, we have two ingredients. It's a subspace, but it's also a closed subset in the Hilbert space. So for example, we could visualize U as a plane in the space. But please don't forget, in general, also U could have an infinite dimension. And now the claim of the projection theorem is that every vector in X can be decomposed into two parts. There, one part is a vector inside the subspace U, and the other part is exactly orthogonal to the whole subspace U. Hence, the important thing here is that we have a right angle between both components. And therefore, this vector inside the subspace U is called the orthogonal projection of X onto U. So the claim of the projection theorem is that this orthogonal projection always exists. So it does not matter which element X from the Hilbert space we choose. And most importantly, there is also only one orthogonal projection of X onto U, which means this decomposition here is uniquely given. So let's put it into a formula. We can write X as a linear combination of two vectors. The first vector is a vector P in U, and the other one is a vector n in the orthogonal complement. Of course, the names are not so important, but the subspaces where they come from. So it's important to remember that p and n are orthogonal to each other. And in addition, they also get special names. As already mentioned, p is called the orthogonal projection of x onto the subspace u. And in order to make this clear, we can also write x restricted to u instead of p. And please note, we can only do this because the orthogonal projection is uniquely given. And on the other hand, we can do exactly the same for the vector n. Hence, there we would write x restricted to u perp. And now it might not surprise you that we call this vector the orthogonal projection of x onto u perp. So this is the whole famous projection theorem, and you might already know it from linear algebra. Hence, the generalization we have here is that the claim also holds for infinite dimensional vector spaces if they are Hilbert spaces. And you might already guess that the crucial part for the proof will be the approximation formula we have for Hilbert spaces. In fact, this will be the content of this video, the proof of this important projection theorem. And as you can see, what we have to prove here is given by two things. We have to show the existence of the decomposition and the uniqueness. So let's start with the uniqueness because it's quite simple. There we only have to use what we know about the intersection of U with the orthogonal complement. This is a general result. This intersection here has to be really small. However, it cannot be empty because here it's an intersection of two subspaces. However, if we take any element Y from this intersection, then we know it lies in the orthogonal complement of U. This means in the inner product we get zero here, no matter which u in u we choose. However, since y also lies in u, we could definitely choose y instead of the u. So what we get is y with itself in the inner product is equal to zero. And there we can use that the inner product is positive definite, which means only the zero vector satisfies this. So you see, the result is that the intersection we have here only consists of the zero vector. And that's something we can use to show the uniqueness of our composition from above. So as always, for a uniqueness proof, we assume that we have two decompositions given. 
Hence, we assume that x can be written as p plus n, but also as p tilde plus n tilde. And obviously the assumptions are the same as before, p and p tilde come from u and n and n tilde from u perp. So you see, this is the natural thing to assume when we want to show uniqueness. And now what we have is that both vector additions represent the same vector x, so we have an equality. So p plus n is equal to p tilde plus n tilde. And now if we use the subtraction of vectors, we have p minus p tilde on the left hand side and n tilde minus n on the right hand side. However, now we can use that we have subspaces, so the left hand side lies in u and the right hand side lies in u perp. This is quite an important point, because of the equality, this means that we actually lie in the intersection of both subspaces. Hence, the left hand side and the right hand side here is given by the zero vector. Which means p and p tilde are the same vector and n and n tilde are the same vector. So the conclusion is, we cannot have two different decompositions, the uniqueness is given. Therefore, the next step is showing the existence of the orthogonal projection. And naturally, here we can finally use our approximation formula. So we choose p as the best approximation we have by the approximation formula. So as a reminder, let's put this important theorem here into a box. So you see, everything we need is satisfied. We have a Hilbert space and we have a closed subspace, so definitely a closed convex set. And then for a given x, the theorem gives us exactly one element in u, and this one we call p. And now what we have to show is that the element x minus p is orthogonal to p, so it lies in the orthogonal complement of u. And as before, this vector we will just call n. So you see, if we can show that n lies in the orthogonal complement, then we have our decomposition of x. And in fact, we already know by the approximation formula that the norm of n is the minimizing distance. And obviously, this is definitely a fact we should use. Okay, but now the question is, how can we use the distance to show orthogonality? And maybe the first connection we can see is that vectors with length 1 already span a whole subspace. So for example, if we say that we have the vector v in the inner product with n, and we assume that v has the length 1, and this inner product is also 0. Moreover, we want to have that for all v in the subspace u. So we could say we test the orthogonality for all directions in u. And then obviously just by scaling the vectors v, we have it for all vectors in the subspace u. So clearly, this statement there is equivalent for n being in the orthogonal complement of u. Okay, so this is definitely something we can use here, because no matter in which direction we run here in u, we know that this connection vector here will be larger than n. Indeed, we can also put this vector into a concrete formula. It's simply the vector x minus the corresponding vector in u. So this one we can write as p plus running in any direction v inside u. And let's say this vector v we scale with any lambda from our field. In other words, this is just saying that any u in our subspace can be written in this form. Okay, and at this point we can finally use that the length of this vector here is definitely larger than the length of our vector n. Or to say it more precisely, the relation we have here is less or equal. So there you see, this is the inequality we want to work with, but you know we have an inner product, so we should work with the squares instead. So let's simply use the inner product here on the right hand side, and then the linearity of it. However, as you might have already seen, we can simplify the vector here, because x minus p is given as n. And then this makes everything shorter, because we only have two vectors in our inner product. And now, as already mentioned, we can use the linearity to transform this one inner product into four parts. And I think I can quickly do that, because you already know how this works. Namely, the first part is the norm of n squared. The second part is minus lambda with n and v. And the third part is similar, it's just the complex conjugate of it. And finally, we have lambda squared in the absolute value 
times the norm of v squared. And there you see why the assumption that v should have length 1 is helpful, because then this term just goes away with 1. And also the whole calculation holds for all scaling factors lambda, which means now we can choose a suitable one. And there you might already see that a lambda given as v with n in the inner product is the correct one to make this equation here nicer. Simply because then we have three times the same term here. In the second term you should see that we just multiply two complex numbers and what we get out is this complex number in the absolute value squared. Hence the other two terms are exactly the same, just the last one has a plus sign. Which actually means we can just forget about them altogether. However, on the other hand, you should also see that we can simply subtract the first term on both sides. And then what we get is an inequality for a non-positive number. Indeed, what we have here is a number that is non-negative and non-positive and therefore it can only be zero. Or more concretely, now we have shown the orthogonality of v with n. And since this claim holds for any direction v, we actually can use our fact and therefore we have shown that n lies in the orthogonal complement of u. And as you should remember, this is actually what we wanted to show to get our decomposition. Hence our nice projection theorem is proven. So from now on we are allowed to talk about orthogonal projections in Hilbert spaces. But please keep in mind, for that we need closed subspaces. Okay, then I would say, let's use the next videos for some applications and examples. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day, bye bye.